Hello, folks. Uh, we are ready to go today. And uh, I want to welcome you to this version of the Languages and Community Stand-Up. And we will be talking about C-Sharp today. Uh, we are I'm really excited to have Matt Storgerson with you. Uh, we had a bit of a rough morning uh, today. So just to make sure I got everything right, if somebody wants to say hello in the chat, that would be totally awesome. So I can make sure y'all can hear me. Uh, so that would be great. Um, I, I've had some dental work, so I am not at my best. Uh, and uh, Bill is sick and he's not here. So if you're looking forward to Bill, I'm sorry. Oh, thank you, folks. Uh, so so we're going to really lean into y'all and Mads today. So uh, Mads is here to answer your questions. And we have we have a pretty loose agenda today. So we know how we're going to kind of start it. But this is all this is your opportunity to ask more, Mads Torgerson, particularly about C Sharp uh, 12 and 13. They kind of, you know, he probably answer other questions as well. So, uh, so except I don't think he really has a good answer to why C sharp architects are Danish. But other than that, you know, I, I can attempt one. But, um, but Mads, welcome. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. So I'm 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 kind of um, the odd one out in that I'm not feeling sick whatsoever. <laughs> so um, I might be uh, the last person standing. Um, uh, we'll see how how it goes. But I'm um, yeah excited to be here. It's been a while since I was on last. I think. Um, definitely more than a year. Uh, so uh, it's going to be exciting to see what you all want to hear about. And um, if no one really has anything to say, well, we'll make something up. So yeah. that'll yeah. serve you right then. Mm. It, it'll, it'll be way better, way better if we get questions and conversation uh, uh, from, from the folks that are watching. So we look forward to that. All right. Well, Matt, I'm going to turn it over to you. Where do you want to start today? Well, um, First of all, uh, let's just say that, you know, let's reiterate, we can go anywhere you like today. And if it's uh, too off topic for me to be able to answer confidently, then I'll cut it off there. But, you know, we don't have to limit to anything that's like what's shipping in C-Sharp 12 or anything like that. I mean, we can talk about um, some of the looser ideas that are being worked on for further out in the future. We can talk about how we do language design. I'm, and uh, if you don't know, like, well, you probably do, but Kathleen and I work super closely together on C Sharp and, um, and with Bill as well, who couldn't be here today. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, um, I think we can easily have a conversation as well here um, if, if good topics come up. But we can start somewhere. I mean, just to, um, just to kind of ease you into it, let's go and, um, you know, let's just go and show a few of the, uh, the places you can go to, um, uh, to uh, learn a little bit more at various levels of kind of engagement. Um, uh, I see, okay, I see some questions coming in. Um, let's just, yeah, let's uh, just spend a minute to kind of um, show my screen for a bit and then um, I'll, I'll get right into those and we can turn the screen on and off as, as we go. That's up to you, Kathleen. To do, put do you want to, do you, so you were starting, I think, to show some things coming in C Sharp 12 first, and then we get two great questions in on DUs and extensions. Uh, would you like to, which direction do you want to go right now? Do you yeah, want to do I'm not going to show any C Sharp 12 things. I just want to get, give people like, as you're sitting there, I think it's a good start. Um, if you, you can share my here? screen, Kathleen, um, uh, just, even as you're sitting there right now watching, there, there's just a couple of places that are good for you to know about um, if you don't already. Of course, um, you know, Bill is the big star of uh, documentation, um, uh, Bill Wagner, who's often here. Um, and uh, the doc pages for C-Sharp uh, are, really, are really fabulous, right? Uh, you And so, something that's fabulous about them is that as we, as we put features into the future version, as we and release um, preview versions of those features for everyone to use with language and preview. Um, Bill also puts preview documentation in here. So there's already like a pretty, um, there's already a pretty full uh, what's new in C Sharp 12 uh, thing right here that you can go and explore. And um, that has been growing all year as we've been putting things in. So I think that's, a, that's uh, if you're ever interested in what's not yet in C-sharp, docs are still a good place to go. You, it's not just for things that are already shipped. So I want to recommend that. I also want to point out um, one thing that uh, Kathleen and Bill and I worked on together. Um, uh, I think we finished a little over a year ago. Is that right? I can't remember. It Anything more than a month is a year to me. Um, 
So it's, it's a C-sharp language strategy. We've had like for, for um, I think seven, eight years-ish, we've had some sort of document that was essentially the essence of how we think about evolving C-sharp, what, what matters to us and what our kind of stance is um, in, in a way that's abstracted from, the spe from specific feature areas. Uh, it's here, I'm not gonna go through it now, but it might also be useful to to read. We gave it a, a, a good update um, and put it in a more accessible place here, right here in Docs. Uh, and as you saw, we can get to it right from them from the Docs homepage. So again, that's some reading for you to go do. If you want to engage more, if you want to see kind of what's what's in the works uh, over in the Rosling repo, the where the compiler is built, uh, there's this language feature status page here. It has um, now the complete list of C sharp 12 features in here like that you can see they're listed here by number by version number and there's already a bunch of stuff in what we call the working set and more stuff will show up here those are the things that aren't shipping yet uh, but could very well some of them will likely make it into the next version some of them might take longer but that's sort of the place to get an overview of what's cooking and then finally the C sharp lang which is the repo where we design C sharp and I'm, uh, I'm not going to take you on a, a bigger tour of it, but all the C-sharp design meetings have meeting notes here under this, um, in this folder here, the proposals that are currently being worked on are in this folder. And um, things are being proposed in, uh, or oh, sorry, in issues here. And then the um, before things become formal proposals, that's discussion as well. And you can, uh, you can, if you really want the detail and the day, day to day, uh, you can go and engage here. That's kind of all I wanted to show for now. And then um, I think we can go and um, I think we got like a couple of screenfuls of questions. Oh, yeah, we did. Thanks so much, folks. So, okay, um, so you want to just start at the The first one was discriminated unions. And uh, yeah, we, we haven't answered this. So so the yeah. statement is, is not, we have not answered this question a thousand times. Uh, um, unless the answer is, we don't know yet. No, I can give I can give a precise answer to this precise question. All right. D U in C sharp thirteen for sure? No. No, it's not for sure. <laughs> okay. The answer is okay. I think they probably we we probably should talk a little bit more about discriminated unions uh, than just saying that we're yeah. we're we're certainly not we're certainly not uh, ready to say they'll be in C sharp thirteen. Um, right. I mean, it's not. And I mean, to start out with, it's not actually a given that C sharp should ever have discriminated unions. Um, in the most languages that have discriminated unions are, you know, functional programming languages where discriminated unions are the way that you model your data. They're the way that you can have polymorphism in your data that you can have, um, you can have a variable that can be one of several different types. In, and in object-oriented programming like C-sharp, we already know how to do that, that we just use inheritance, right? Inheritance is, is a thing to create that kind of polymorphism. Um, so a flippant answer would be, we don't need discriminated units in C-sharp because you have you have an object-oriented um, abstraction mechanism. What's wrong with that, you know? So, but, but that kind of ignores that there are several benefits uh, like both have pros and cons uh, against each other. And there are several benefits that discriminated unions have that would be lovely to have in C-sharp. And the, the sort of big questions are around, first of all, um, you know, can we get, how, how can we get those benefits without too much um, redundancy in the language? Like where we don't have like, two different abstraction mechanisms that are 80% equally capable, but are completely separate, right? So, it's a, so that's like a, a question of, of deep unification. How can we do discriminated unions or the thing to um, the, whatever corresponding thing we wanna do in a way that's more incrementally on top of what's already there and more unified with what's already there. Right. So that's that's a big, Difficult question. Some some languages have tried to tackle that before. I think the the first and foremost of those is Scala, which uh, started out right from the get go, like a couple of decades ago, saying, "Hey, we want to unify object oriented and functional paradigms completely and and express them in terms of each other." So that's a big inspiration for us in terms of that that kind of 
continued unity uh, value proposition of C-sharp. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, now that I have a meeting up scheduled for us to talk about some things about discriminated unions, and there's a couple of things I think I'm just going to throw at you right now that we haven't talked about before because I think folks would probably, uh, you know, like to see that. So Matt gets to disagree with me here. We have no prior, we have no prior conversation on this, and that is that um, I think there's a lot of things about characteristics of discriminated unions that if we if we step back from the word discriminated union because then we start thinking TypeScript or F Sharp or do it like this, do it like that. So if we step back from the word and we look at the characteristics. There's two characteristics which I love in F-sharp unions, and they come together in F-sharp unions, but I'm not sure we have to do them together. And one is exhaust exhaustiveness, which means that if you have a, a group of things um, that, are, that are interchangeable, that uh, if, if you add a new one, then you're going to be able to recognize that and say somewhere else that your switch is not complete. Now that switch would have to not have a default because then it would already be complete. So a switch without a default that, so then if you had um, red and, and blue and you added yellow, then it would light up every place that you had a, um, th that, you, that you were using a switch and you weren't doing that. That's exhaustive. And the other one I'm thinking about is, I'm calling restricted. I, Matt's may have a better name for it than I am, which is that if you have a switch statement, it can't have anything else and you can't hold something in this value. So right now, inheritance, it's okay. But the problem with inheritance is that there's no limit on it. So you always need that default because someone could have always thrown another value in there. And I think that the F-sharp union, which is also restricted, you must be one of those values. You can never be anything else. I think there's value. And the important thing to me is that I can, have, I can explain scenarios where both of those are very valuable. And so um, I'm thinking right now more in terms of trying to explore characteristics for discriminated unions and then come back to the word after we've gone that route. So anyway, that was what I was going to tell Mads in a meeting next week. I thought I'd go ahead and throw it at him right now uh, in front of y'all and see how bad I can embarrass myself. So uh, so uh, I, what do you think, Mads? I'm, I'm, I'm very much on board with that. I think <clears throat> even, even if we end up doing a full-blown unions feature, I think we would that would have this notion of exhaustiveness built into it. I think we would also go and revisit other parts of the language, enums, for instance, yeah, and absolutely. just and just do exhaustiveness for them as well. But you can say this enum is exhaustive. It can only have these five values. And so on the one hand, I get to switch on them without a default and I get an, uh, and, and, um, and still have the switch uh, light up as complete or show as complete. Uh, you can hear switches or pattern matching are very important to this whole area. Um, but on yeah, uh, but on the other hand, I can't just uh, convert an int into my enum and 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 expect everything to be good. Yeah. So um, so that yeah, that's part of that whole like unification ethos that we want to we, we sort of need to deconstruct the features that people are asking us for, um, and and find their individual constituent parts, um, so that we can have more freedom and and kind of economy in the way that we integrate them into C sharp. We don't we don't we don't need for things to look like they already look in another language. Like C sharp is fine to go and have things be different than anyone else. We don't we don't worry about that. Uh, we um, the 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 time where C sharp tried to look like other languages for adoption is is over long ago, right? It, I, there was definitely such a time. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. so if we can find something that's sort of like deeper and more well integrated than what exists out there today, we will do it. Like we're not afraid of that. We just need to we need to have confidence that it'll do the job, um, but it doesn't have to look like anything else. Right. Well, another thing I realized that if folk, for folks that haven't used discriminated unions in a language like F Sharp that supports this well, one of the other things that we'll, uh, I guess, can't imagine us not having in our switch statements would be deconstruction. So if you have some uh, something that has a, a single name and something else has a first name and a last name, as you switch over it, you can get to those component parts the same way you can uh, with a type today. So we would expect to still be doing that, which is one of the ways that discriminated units get used a lot. So yeah, we're not getting a lot of following questions other than a, a great one that um, uh, I'll actually show real quick here that 
Um, it is an important part of the way that, that domain uh, driven develop design has been done in some other languages. It's, it's really critical there. And people just kind of, I don't know, they, they just kind of don't worry about some problems like there's a stray value that you've never seen before showing up. Uh, and when doing it right now with, with C-sharp, people certainly do domain-driven design with C-sharp, uh, but, but F-sharp is particularly good for it for several reasons, including that. And, Actually, uh, go ahead. Kathleen, I'm wondering, um, looking over the next several questions, I'm not sure we're going to need my screen. Okay, we, yeah. Should we just flip Thanks. to our, our beautiful... Yeah, uh, let's just look at us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, yeah, okay. Super. Okay, so um, yeah, thanks. That was great. Um, uh, so here's another one that, um, you know, that uh, it, it, it makes it easy to communicate around it. Um, and uh, then there's a couple of other things in here about some other things that, that we can get back to with other questions once we close out discriminated unions. But So if anyone has any other questions on what we said on discriminated unions, and we're also looking at tagged unions, which are more like a, a TypeScript style. Um, but uh, I, I at least am much more familiar with the F-sharp uh, unions because that's one of my languages. So yeah. I, no, actually, uh, so I'm, I'm going to correct you a little bit here. Okay. Um, you told me that I could. Um, yes, you can. So tag, well, unions can. Is, tag unions is a word that we use for the thing that's called discriminated unions in other okay. languages as okay. both because it's shorter and because it removes us a little bit from the psychological uh, kind of box that it puts us in to okay. call them discriminated unions. So those are unions where every so for those out there who are thinking they're talking about unions now for like what 10 minutes what is a union you know um unions are a type that says you can be one of these specific options and they're kind of two flavors of them that we're looking at one is what we call tagged unions which is every kind of thing it can have comes along with a tag a name an identifier that says i'm this kind or i'm this kind or i'm this kind and one of the things that gives you is that even if you have, and each kind can have its own type, but they can also have the same type, right? So you can get disjointness. You can say, I know that I'm in this case because of the name, even if there are two different ones that happen to carry an int with them or something. And then there's type unions, which is what TypeScript embodies that I think probably the most popular language that, that has kind of pure type unions, uh, which is where there's no like discriminant and no you just say I'm a I'm a bool or an int or a string, and and then you do type checking to figure out which of them you are. That so it's a type match uh, kind of. It can both have very legitimate scenarios. Um, they rarely show up together in languages, and so I, I think we thought for a long time that we would have to pick one <laughs> and go with it. And I'm not sure about that. I think that there are ways that um, I certainly don't want to add two union features to C-sharp, but there, I think there are ways we can think about um, unifying the two and having them kind of fit into the same framework. So um, so all hope is not lost there. But obviously, in an object-oriented system, type unions aren't necessarily disjoint. I noticed that was a word that some people were yeah. using in chat here. They um, Because you could have a, a type union of two interfaces. Um, and then a value that implements both, you know, both interfaces would be in the union in two different ways, so to speak. It would be because it would fall under both of those interfaces. So that you can have values that aren't clearly in one case or the other. And whichever you test for first is the one that fires, right? So, so that's, yeah, that becomes that you get, you get different ergonomics there. And then the last thing, I, let, let me mention one more thing about unions and then I'll stop. The last thing is that um, that's not necessarily a distinction between discriminated and type or tagged and tight unions, but it's often the case that tag unions are declared ahead of time. Somebody has to declare this is union type with a name and so that you can say, where are the tags? Whereas union types are much more um, amenable to being anonymous. Like they can just show up in code. Nobody's declared this particular union type. You just express it with like a, I don't know, a vertical bar or something, an or syntax or whatever. And that's indeed, TypeScript is very structural about its uh, union types. And C Sharp is not a, does not have a structural type system um, to nearly the same degree. So if we were to go that way, um, we'd have to find find out how to how to bridge between a structural 
union type and a nominal type system around it? How do they work together? That will be one of the challenges. There. Okay. I've got one more comment I'm going to show on this because it just kind of summarizes um, why this has been hard for us. Um, why you don't already have, we know that a lot of people want to see discriminated unions. We want to see discriminated unions. We'll use them heavily in Rosalind. I will use them heavily in my own code. Um, we, we, we are as excited about this future as, yeah, I, I don't know, I would say as anybody, but we want this future. However, we don't want it unless it's idiomatic C-sharp and you say C-sharp got better instead of C-sharp got discriminated unions. Um, so yeah, we we don't check boxes, uh, and and we'll stand by that. So yeah, if anybody wants to complain, you can. But you know, we do think it's a valuable feature. We think it's it's a really important feature in the languages where it's used. We assume it will be an important feature if we get get it right. But if it yes. feels like we bolted somebody else's feature on the side of C sharp, we failed, and nobody will be happy with us. So yeah. Yeah, and to uh, be clear, we are we are working actively on it. it we yeah. have um, we have a sub group of the C sharp language design team that meets every week currently to to um, kind of visit the different evidence and and um, give us like a clear uh, a clearer slate of options here so yeah and then we had a couple more come in this one I had to share which is that they um, is that well it, it, yeah. Uh, it, it is, it is, you can wind up with a separate value somehow sneaking in. So dangerous is, you know, mm -hmm. your defaults might get hit. So yeah, that's, um, uh, yeah, I thought that was super interesting when it, when it, uh, when that came up that using F sharp unions in order to, it's very concise syntax in F sharp. Uh, there's some other things in F sharp that also could help with, with domain modeling and the simplicity of it, including the very good book that Scott Lashen uh, wrote that was mentioned earlier. So, yeah. But I think maybe we should go on. And uh, you know, if we go back to the top of the chat, uh, there's another big topic that got mentioned early on. And I think that maybe we should just go there, which is extensions. How far along the process are extensions? Is it something we can expect to see in C-Sharp 13? Yeah. Um, so I hope we can see the first down payment of extensions in C-Sharp 13. I think it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna be one of those features that will have to probably evolve over a couple of releases. Um, so for those wondering what extensions refers to, um, it's essentially an idea that you can have, um, it's an idea that kind of unifies lightweight wrapper types with um, a way that you can get extension everything. Like when you have extension methods today, you could get extension properties and static members and, and operators and all that kind of stuff. So um, the, um, and, and I do, if we want, I do have some, I, I don't, we don't have a prototype I can show yet, but I, um, uh, but I do have some slides we can go and, and look at if we want. They were the same slides we brought to build in spring. So there's nothing new there, but I, I'm happy to, to, if we want to go in. But I, but um, to answer your question, uh the 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 challenge here is um if we get very so extensions essentially need to do things on behalf of other types right either explicitly as a wrapper type or implicitly by just being in scope and kind of the holy grail of that would be if they if one of the things they could do on behalf of other types is to implement interfaces on their behalf so you can say okay Got this type over here. I it's a library I'm using, um, and I got this framework over here. It uses a certain interface as kind of like the um, the type you have to plug into and implement to play in that framework. Okay, that's not an uncommon situation. Now, how do I take my things from from one side and plug them into the other side? I think I used opposite sides before. It's very confusing, um, and if you had something like extension interfaces, I could say, well, I'm this third party here, library or myself, um, as the app developer, I'm implementing that interface over there with uh, for that uh, class over there, and I'm here's how it implements. It. Um, and you can imagine that that's that's easy to say and, and hard to do under the covers, and um, and we we know ways that we can do it, but it would sacrifice some of the structuralness 
of um, extensions in uh, they it will they, they will it will make them kind of a heavier concept that isn't as the extensions wouldn't be as interchangeable with the sort of underlying type. So, so there's a, a difficult trade-off there. We've, we've looked at, can we solve that by enhancing the runtime? And maybe we can one day, but every time um, Julian who's working on this current, who's been working on uh, prototyping a lot of this and specking a lot of it, and the uh, folks we've been talking to in the runtime, we've spent a lot of time kind of deep diving on that. And so far we don't see an easy path to get everything we want at the same time. We can get everything, it, it, everything we want is achievable individually, but getting it all together is a big challenge. So what what I'm looking for now, I think, is a, a path to get like 80% value that um, does not require solving those uh, gnarly problems, um, or maybe even 40 and then another 40, and then the last 20 is getting them to work together. But uh, we just, when you do that kind of thing, where you're sort of like, you're doing part of what you had envisioned, it's really good if you have a clear shot, you have a vision for how can we get the rest of the way, at least some notion of how could we complete this in the future. Um, so I'm just a little worried about embarking down on a path syntactically, semantically, in terms of how we encode this in, uh, down to IL, that it turns out to be a dead end. That's, that's sort of the hesitation right now. Otherwise, that we know how to do the 80%. So um, I want to uh, just take a, a quick side note to a question that I'm not sure I'm going to get back to really quick, um, which is that uh, what do we mean by idiomatic? And I, I do actually think that's worth a minute. Then I want to jump back to extensions. Um, but I, I, we use that word. And, and I think that taking a quick minute to say that to me, and you can say what it means to you, it means that somebody who's using C Sharp today sees a new feature and it feels like it's an a better C sharp. It looks like it's improving C sharp. It's just something bolted on the side. So, Mads, I don't know if you have a more gracious or specific way to uh, to define idiomatic for C sharp. I I haven't thought about the definition before, but I think there's definitely there's something like that there. Now, I I just do want to acknowledge that for many new features in C sharp, people still they still feel foreign to people for a while. Like so, we. As a as a design team, we kind of have to we have to take a little bit of a leap of faith every time that when we've worked on the feature design for a while, we feel like this is a good fit for C sharp. This will be a, a this will fit together with the rest of C sharp, so that when you overcome that novelty shock, if you will, like oh my god, what is this? I've never seen this before. I can't read C sharp anymore, which you know is a very valid reaction. <laughs> Um, then once you kind of get into it and understand what it's doing, you're like, yeah, yeah, okay, that's a good fit. That's they did, you know, they did pattern matching in a way that fits well into C sharp, even though they never had pattern matching before. And that was a big like new concept for me to learn. Now that I've learned it, I, you know, they didn't do it in a way that is at odds with the rest of the language. On the contrary, they kind of complement the language. That's what we're going for. So it, so idiomatic. Uh, mm -hmm. If that's what we mean by idiomatic, then I completely agree. It's it's just it's unavoidable that when you see something new, especially when a version comes out and there's like three or four new features being presented in one go, and you're like, I can never keep up anymore. Um, that's that overwhelm is is legit, and um, and I don't think any approach to feature design other than not doing anything at all <laughs> could could really totally avoid that. So that's the only modification I want to make. Yeah, I, I like you bringing up pattern matching because we brought pattern matching in in like two super major ways. One is bringing into the if statement. So if statements can pattern match now. And that cleaned up some code that was very common prior to when we first introduced um, uh, patterns. So that was a, a big deal. And then um, they also work in a switch statement, which is the kind of a switch people have been using since uh, 2002 or 2000, whenever you picked up the the, um, the preview. And then we have the new thing, which is switch expressions, which when you're ready to go there, really make your code a lot more concise and nice. But you don't have to jump all the way to switch expressions in order to use pattern matching. And so I think that's an example of making something 
idiomatic because we, and then there's various things that I think we did around that as well that, that helped, including using the um, equal sign greater than arrow. So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's, um, the, I think that the, the thing that really made pattern matching click when we added it was that C Sharp already had an is expression. Yeah. You could check whether an expression was something, but that something would always have to be a type. And then we had the switch statement, as you said, which could also test that an incoming value was something, but that something had to be a constant. And um, and to sort of marry those two uh, can be can be this constant or can be this type into the notion of pattern and then expanding that so that, oh, it can be this type and here's a name for it, or it can be this structure or other things over time. Like to marry those two things together so that we could put patterns back into the existing is expression and the existing switch statement and make them kind of grow in place of something people are already familiar with. That that yeah. thing really contributed to that idiomaticness of how pattern matching came into C Sharp. Then it it avoided that bolted on kind of feel that we were worried about. And that had been the big sticking point for us uh, as we were cont contemplating patterns prior to that. So yeah. good example. Yeah. Well, I think I want to switch back to, to extensions for just a minute. We got this mm -hmm. comment. Okay. Um, and so I'll just start by saying we didn't introduce extensions with a lot of detail, but um, there, there, there are two things. Implicit and explicit extensions is the way we're currently thinking about them. And implicit extension is extension everything. So right now you can do an extension method. It just says, well, let's just open the floodgates. And so, uh, Madge, you can take it from there and, and give a little bit more about that and then maybe talk a little bit about explicit extensions with or without slides. So uh, yeah, let's just give um, a little I'm, bit of a background on, on what we're talking about so people aren't like, what? Why don't we go spend five minutes with the slides then? Okay. Um, so as soon as you get your slides up, I'll, I'll get it. Um, all right. Let me just go and, okay, they're up. Um, hang on. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I made a mistake. Okay, there we go. There it is. Um, so, I mean, this is my, I mean, I'm I'm sort of a little bit obsessed with unification. <laughs> if you go back to when I was even a, a professor and before that a PhD student many years ago, you'll find things titled unifying this or unifying that. So I think that generally serves C-sharp well, but sometimes maybe I go overboard. But okay, there you have it. Um, so we're going to try to unify if you can create one feature that kind of handles many related scenarios, that's always good. So that's what we're currently looking at with extensions. And um, so let me start out with what we call explicit extensions. And you can kind of, whatever you're thinking in, in terms of uh, extension methods and extension everything, you can kind of put that on the shelf for a bit, and we'll get back to it in a second. Um, so explicit extensions are not that exactly. Um, the idea of an explicit extension is essentially it's a it's a fancy alias. You know, you already have using alias in C sharp. They're kind of dumb and limited. Um, th so start out by thinking of this as like the the uh, the using alias of your dreams. <laughs> okay, <laughs> hopefully not, not your nightmares. Um, so what wh why? So this is an example, all right? We have a um, oh I should I should click on the actual code and not on stream yard here where it's being shown. Okay, so you have. Um, uh, uh, and the the an explicit extension that's called data set of t. Okay, so unlike an, an alias today, it can be it can have um an accessibility. It's an actual type declaration. You can export it and everything. It's not just for the file. Um, it can be generic, uh, so it can take whatever type parameters it wants and use them in the in the body, so to speak. Um, you can um. Uh, you can refer to other types that are in scope without, you know, and in, in using today, you have to give the full name of everything because the the other usings don't apply to a using alias, which is kind of dumb. And it can have a body. Okay. So this is a name for, so data set of T is a name for dictionary of string comma T um, with a generic constraint and everything. And then that's a body where it can add functionality on top. And we'll go and uh, uh, I'm not going to use this example anymore. It's just to have an example that kind of does all of it at once. But we will get back to the body. And I think, I think, and this is probably going to um, be controversial even on the Langstein team, but I think explicit extension should be the default. 
So I'm just going to not write it anymore. So it's going to be like this. Um, so here's an example, right? You, I have some code that displays strings that are supposed to be JSON. You can see that from the variable name. <laughs> and I'm passing it some JSON. Right? Um, well, maybe it would be nice if the type could sort of indicate more clearly that we are looking for a string that has JSON in it. So we'll make an alias for it, a public extension JSON string, and just put that in scope and everyone can use it. That's a simple extension. And now we can use JSON string here in the display um, method to indicate that. But we could also give it a body with some extra function members that are related specifically to the fact that it's for JSON, right? So now we can give it a parse method that parses the string as JSON and gives us back some dictionary thing that we will call data object. And we'll say hello to that yeah, a couple more times, but just assume there's a, a weekly typed dictionary structure, uh, semi-structured data representation called data object here. We can put that parse method on there. And then when I'm calling my strings JSON strings, that extra method is available to me. So because I took in a JSON string and not a string, it has a parse method, still just a string underneath, but we gave it extra functionality that travels with it through the type. That's kind of neat. And of course, we could have another, we can have XML string as well that does just the same, except it parses it as XML. Um, because these are explicit types that you're explicitly using instead of string when you want that uh, sort of domain specific behavior to show up. So I could have XML strings and JSON strings side by side. They're all just strings, really but they have different behavior, um, but they have different extra kind of functionality attached to them. Makes sense so far? And then uh, an you know, example of that would be to actually take some of that semi-structured data and give it like a strongly typed veneer, like pretend we're TypeScript here. We take our, our, our weakly typed dictionary objects and we give them a, a face. So, so we let's say we got some data over the wire, we happen to know it should be shaped like a customer. It should have a name and an address and an orders. And we could just implement those as functionality on top of data object. Uh, so whenever we're looking at a data object as a customer, we get IntelliSense, we get strong types on the return of these properties and so on. But it really, under the hood, it just looks up in the dictionary. And you know, it'll crash at runtime if the data didn't fit the shape. But that's fine. Um, we're just expressing our our types of kind of expectations of shapes here, just like TypeScript is always, always works with its types. Um, and that could be an order. That's another view of the same. And when you think they're orders, you can get put this shape on top and use them like that. And they can even refer to each other. And you could imagine that these aren't actually something you have to author, but you could imagine that they were source generated by a source generator from some schema data or some example data or something like that. And just kind of, um, included with, uh, with your C-sharp and giving you a better tooling experience around using this. And when you think about that source generator approach, this almost feels like the um, type providers that F-sharp has had for many years in some ways, that you have um, functionality that generates types for you for data that isn't inherently, uh, C inherently in C-sharp or internet. Okay. So I'm just going to ask for uh, Rumfus to ask again if this didn't clarify the answer to, to this particular question. It's because a data object can be many different things depending on what you're doing right now. Yes. So the name here really is a type name. And the only way you can use it is through that type name. Again, we're not doing like extension methods or anything yet. This is like... I. I only get the customer stuff when I say that I'm working with customers. It's like any other type in that respect. The only difference is it it sort of lightly wraps uh, another type, um, and that type is is the the sort of data truth of the thing. This extension can't add its own fields or anything. I can't add its own state. It's really just a you know a pair of glasses that I put on and look at a data object in a certain way. And, and offer some members to interpret the data object in the way that this extension represents. Okay. That's why I really need the names here. Um, uh, they, they wouldn't do anything otherwise. Now, uh, that's a, a great segue though, to then talk about implicit extensions. And to, 
that that's sort of explicit extensions seem like kind of a very useful feature on their own, but I think they're also a great mechanism for introducing what we call implicit extensions. Let's say we put the keyword implicit in front. Now, the this implicit extension for for data object automatically applies. Like if I look up a member on, on data object and it isn't there, then because there's an implicit extension on it, I will go to JSON object and check there. Right. So JSON object becomes my fallback. I'm going to say in this scope, every data object is a, is a JSON object. And I don't even have to say that. I can just look members up and it will, it will find the ones on JSON object as a fallback. That's exactly what extension methods do today, right? It's a thing. It's a it's a method that we'll go and look for if there wasn't anything on the type itself. But because I'm I'm declaring it in the shape of a a type for that overlays the other type. Like I can have other function members that apply not just not not just instance methods, and I kind of get them all gathered together for the type that they apply to instead of extension methods today, which kind of sit in random places in static classes, right? They can't, um, they're associated with their underlying type only through the first this parameter on them, which is a little kind of obscure maybe. So um, so with that, I can, well, I can now work on a data object, but because I have the extension members that this exten implicit extension introduces, I have those in scope, I can call those extra methods. Data objects to me, have a two JSON method because the extension brought them in. Just that's just extension methods how they work. But I can also like use the static method that's there on data object itself, even though data object was not declared with it, because the extension added it. And of course, you could you could imagine even operators or indexers or whatever you know being introduced in this way. And again, at at the sort of ultimate like pipe dream of this. Maybe it could even implement an interface on behalf of data object. You say, yeah, data object, not only JSON object allows us to work with data objects in a JSON specific way, even to the point that they are parsable um, by implementing the iParsable interface uh, that says we have a parse method that can produce this object from JSON. Right? So crazy stuff. And this last bit here is the one that's kind of giving us, it's a little, it's the icing on top feature wise, but it's very expressive and it's very hard to get to, it turns out. So that's and, a, that's the, the quick uh, kind of uh, summary. here. And we have a couple of questions. One's on screen right now. Okay. For the implicit extensions, do they work similar to implicit classes in Scala? I don't know anything about Scala. Oh, so I sorry. can't remember. I'm sorry. I, okay, uh, great. Okay. Uh, and then, um, I think that uh, this one um, is probably a good one to take a quick look at. So, yeah. <laughs> it's, um, With implicit extensions, if data object then implements to JSON, but I compiled before that type had it, who wins? Well, this is resolved at compile time. So, yeah, it, it, you can do many, many weird things if you compile out of order. Um, and we don't kind of like, if the compiler can't see that uh, data object has a two JSON method, then it's going to assume it doesn't, and it's going to hard code a call to the implicit extension instead. And then, if you don't recompile when data object gets the two JSON method, then yeah, you're going to sort of get the wrong one. <laughs> that's yeah, that's probably how this will work. And we have to worry about all these things as we look at implementation. This this could well be an error. What if multiple implicit extensions implement the same interface for the type? That's a really great question because that gets into um, disambiguation. Okay, so even and and what we're trying to the way we're trying to think about that is to just extend what we have already for extension methods today. Um, uh, so if you have two extension methods that apply equally. They're just ambiguous. You're just going to be told you're going to have to disambiguate. You can't. We can't pick for you. The way you disambiguate today is that you go to this. Then you specifically go to the static class where the extension method really is a static method, and you call it as a static method. So you kind of change syntax on it. Um, what you can do here with this uh, um, with this approach to disambiguate is you can 
you can take your data object and explicitly cast it to the interface, uh, sorry, to the um, extension, the implicit extension that you are, uh, that you want to use. So you can use an implicit extension as an explicit extension. An implicit extension is an, oh, sorry, an implicit extension is an explicit extension as well, okay? So yes, it implies implicitly if it can, and if there's ambiguity and stuff, um, or you didn't import it like that, you can still use it as an explicit extension. So now you go and say, okay, turn the data object into JSON object because I want a JSON object's implementation of iParsable. And then you can call the member on, on it there or use the, um, or, or convert to the interface from there or whatever you want to do. So how you disambiguate is you cast to the extension that you want to apply. Okay, that sounds great. I do think we want to do a little bit of uh, context check right here. Uh, and that is that no. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> um, so we we did say in the in the stream notes that we were going to do C Sharp 12 and beyond. And we're doing a lot of beyond uh, today, talking about stuff coming because um, we at the beginning gave a link where you can just go look up the new features. And so more interesting today to spend a bit more time with Matt's talking about what's coming. So everything we're talking about here will is beyond .NET 8. So it may be in .NET 9, it may not be, it may be in 10, or it may partially be in, in uh, 9 and a little bit later. And we, we don't know on any of this. We're very early in our planning and we're just, we get to do this big imagining this time of year and we wanted to share that with you. Yeah, and it, to, again, we, we've done some significant prototyping work on this, um, but not to the point of, we mostly, prototypes sort of the top layers. We haven't gotten poked all the way through to where we are emitting code. So the prototype is useless <laughs> um, to like kind of, it's been good to learn from, but it's not good for like trying examples out and so on. Um, so that's the next thing we're going to do is to frame up that prototype, maybe find a way to share it in, in very experimental form. Um, it could be an experimental language feature that shows up as um, under preview language and preview, but um, we'll see how that kind of goes. Yeah. Because what I would love is for, I would love to get more user input, honestly, on which scenarios we, among many possible that we should optimize for here. Kind of like the, disc the discriminated unions, right? Which there are multiple different scenarios. Uh, they're all attractive, uh, but they might not all be possible at the same time, at least, or ever. <laughs> So if we if we have to pick, we want to make an informed choice, and we need as much user feedback as possible on that. And prototypes can help with that. Yeah, and I've got another one. Uh, so I want to uh, go ahead and uh, have us um, uh, talk about this, which is you know we certainly keep VB and F sharp in mind when we're doing uh, development, and we have a commitment to those languages, um, but not. For every single feature working, it, certainly um, we we sometimes drop back to a consumption, and VB and F sharp may have different decisions on this. And the answer is we don't know yet, but we will definitely be um, uh, we will be very careful about implementing anything that could not be done in all the languages. We I'm not going to say we never would um, because we can't constrain C sharp excessively, but uh, we manage but uh, uh, some other features in that work at least part way in uh, Visual Basic and F Sharp, since it has a different compiler, is in a very different mode. So it's always, it's kind of playing catch up sometimes, um, but we've done a good job this year incorporating uh, uh, the F Sharp uh, engineering uh, manager, Vlad Zaratowski, uh, more into our discussions earlier. And so that's been uh, a commitment. We also joined and put, um, I'm the PM for .NET languages. And we didn't really do that in the past. We had separate thinking on different languages because they do need to evolve. And I think of them very, very differently, but they're all my babies. And so we definitely keep, you know, we, we were definitely doing, we've done a lot of structural things to make it easier for us not to surprise F sharp, which we some people know we've done in the past. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, that is, that's something that, you know, with Kathleen spanning them all, that's not going to happen anymore. And any, we don't. When we ship a feature that alters potentially the shape of public APIs in C sharp, either because we changed, often because we added a runtime feature or changed some metadata format or 
something like that. We uh, we make sure that there is some story that isn't just the compiler crashing or something for for VB and F sharp. And and as Kathleen mentioned, oftentimes the VB story is we find out how this can be consumed, um, but we don't give you syntax. We try not to add new syntax to VB anymore, right? And and so we don't give you syntax to produce these declarations, but we try to make it so that you can consume them gracefully. Yeah, so that's we think about how that works out. And if we can't, uh, then, and it's a feature that we would like to still put in libraries, then we try to provide an alternative. For instance, uh, VB doesn't do great with span types, um, but uh, so any API that takes span of T um, in our public APIs will typically have an alternative that takes a type that VB can produce and work with. So yeah. Yeah. F-sharp yeah. very often chooses to embrace a feature more fully, um, yeah. but it's still in a, a case by case basis. Yeah. And it's one of the, if you look at the F-sharp language strategy, you'll see that, that interrupt is one of the things that uh, is part of the F-sharp language strategy because we know a lot of people do that. Um, switching gears a little bit, because we talked about that for a long time. we got about 10 minutes left. Mm -hmm. uh, read only modify a new primary constructor, and uh, I'll just throw that one out to you. Oh, I can't put read only modify in a new primary constructor. Uh, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, right, was, um, yeah. There's the reason we are kind of giggling here is that there was um, uh, there was some emotion around this topic. So, for primary constructors, they're a way to you know put constructor parameters on your class, um, and then they're in scope for the whole class, so you can choose to use them as your object state or part of your object state. You don't have to explicitly declare a field and assign them in there if you don't want to. But a lot of people like to have their state declared read-only for good reason. Like you want to make sure that you, you guarantee that this object or part of this object is immutable. Um, and with the primary constructor, way of declaring object state. There wasn't syntax to do that, and there still isn't. Um, so there was uh, there was a lot of emotion about, oh, we can't use primary constructors because we want to be read on. Now, um, the actually, you, you, so we, we didn't do, we, we talked about putting a read-only keyword, allowing a read-only keyword in primary constructors. And we didn't go there because we the runway was too short and we weren't sure we were doing the right thing. We wanted more user data. Um, so, and it's not the case that you can't use primary constructors at all if you want read-only state. It's just that when you do, you still have to declare your own field that's read-only and assign it from the incoming parameter. Like, so you have to do more work than for non-read-only scenarios, but still, you get less work than you have to do today, right? You still get the the other benefit of the primary constructor that it's right there in the class instead of having to do trivial assign, um, sorry, a trivial like constructor uh, declaration. So um, we decided, okay, let's go with this. And then as people adopt it and we get to see code bases in action, um, so on, we can, we can get a read on should we add the read-only keyword? We currently lean in that direction, but is it really like as important as we thought? And if and when we find that it is, then hopefully the scenarios out there can help guide some of the design decisions we struggle with, like what should it mean exactly? Um, there, because there were multiple options and they were kind of confounding. So, yeah. This is not closed off in any way. Um, and it often happens that a feature comes in and then it kind of gets nips and tucks over the next version or two until it, it's kind of got the right surface area. So, and this is kind of the same thing. So I just put it up there because it's it's very much the same question and the same answer. We we will keep looking at this at the scenarios. Um, with five minutes to go, what I'd like to do is uh, I'm, I'm scrolling around trying to find... Uh, comments, I can certainly find some. But if there's something you're feeling like, oh, please get to this, throw it back in the chat, copy, do whatever you need to do, get it back in the chat for me. And uh, as quick as you can, and we'll do a couple of things that people may want to come back to. And if I don't get something real quick, I got a couple in mind that we can uh, we can go back to. 
Um, we do have this one, which I, I, I'm afraid of the, um, it, at the moment, this is going to be kind of a, a no. Um, it, it's it's something that I think that you could put in C-sharp Lang. It might be good for us to keep our eye on, but we don't tend, we don't have any intention of doing that. For those of you who don't know, in uh, F-sharp, if you use a backtick uh, in a, a symbol, you can use whatever name you want. It can have anything in it you want. Emojis are fine. And so uh, with that, I'm pretty sure emojis are fine, but you can put spaces and things. And so you can write a sentence and, and it can be quite long. And so um, people generally use that only for testing, uh, test names. And so um, that's the reason for the question. We don't have any intention to do that right now. Um, and let me see if there's anything else. Uh, got this one I didn't look at very closely. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah, this is a um, uh, good good point. Um, this is a place that we cut off the name of feature way back when we introduced it. We discussed it. Should there be should we be able to use an open type there? So you see the list uh, open close angle bracket there without typing. You can't say that today. Um, we it it turned out to have surprising implications if we did. Like you can. It's kind of weird to some people. You say type of, and then an empty angle bracket. So why can't you say name of? Um, and and the reason, uh, if I recall correctly, I don't even remember anymore. I, 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 I think I, make sure it's make sure it's on C sharp line. If it's not, if it is voted up, if it's not, add it. Um, yeah. And it could be really as simple as what you've got there, because uh, I think it's a it's a great thing for us to think about. I'm going to close this out with some, a little bit, I'll let you talk a little bit about language uh, shape and simplicity. We've had a couple of these, so I'm going to use this one and then tell you about the others. Uh, there was, um, somebody has actually asked several times why we need the curly brackets uh, in C-sharp. We have this one about round brackets, and then we have somebody who said what we're adding to the language is messing it up. And uh, so I thought that we'd close out with you making some comments about the general, you know, C-sharp looks this way, and, and just some general things about that. Uh, and whether we think about uh, any of these, th any of these changes, um, and that kind of thing. So let's go there. Yeah, I think this is a really good question about the round, uh, the, the, the parentheses, um, required parentheses in these statement forms. And it, if you, if you've ever seen, have you ever seen like a C sharp one program? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, some of you out there have probably been in the game for that long or have seen some of that code and some of you haven't. And um, it, those parentheses were the least of your troubles when it came to kind of <laughs> verbosity, right? It wasn't quite VB, which had more words and less, um, and less like uh, symbols. So VB would be even longer, um, but C sharp, was nothing if not verbose by today's standards. And actually, a lot of the language features we've done over time have been to reduce the need for verbosity. Like you can have ex expression bodies if you just, you know, that kind of thing, many, many things. But when you get to stuff like this, where they're around the, 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 the required parentheses, it is surprisingly hard to remove those <laughs> from the language, not for any like psychological or or um, idiomaticness reasons, but because if you do, then something probably breaks. You, then you know, then you will have code that the meaning isn't clear. The compiler can't figure it out because we've let ourselves evolve expressions over time with the assumption that in these situations they're they're parenthesized so it's fine so I, you could i'm i'm definitely open to this kind of thing i don't want to be dogmatic about oh that's just the syntax so that's so you just live with it and you can see that m many places in the language we've um we've taken steps like that you have you have using var now you you can you can have um Instead of needing a using statement to have your I disposable disposed at the end, you can just put a variable declaration, put using in front of a variable declaration, it gets disposed at the end of the block and so on. I, we we want to go those places. It's fine as long as it still looks readable and fine. But I worry about if before we were to do something like that, remove 
the need for the friends, we would need to do like a very serious exploration to see if it would be um, even possible for us to unambiguously parse programs anymore. And we kind of want to unambiguously parse programs. <laughs> so, so it could be that we just can't for technical reasons go there. And it could also be that when we write out the examples, it actually looks horrendous and and doesn't feel right to us and um, and doesn't feel like a good improvement. Like if it would introduce disproportionate amounts of confusion to the code, I'm not saying it will. I just haven't tried it out. Uh, mm -hmm. Then even though even if we could, we might not do it. Yeah, and on the on the curly brackets, that's harder because languages sort of need an end of some sort, uh, Visual Basic, when you open a, a method, doesn't need it. It does when you close the method. And so while the open curly, you can look at and go, how important is that? The closed curly, though, you absolutely have to have. And the languages that you might think of, which would be um, uh, things like F Sharp um, that are space delimited, a Python's another one, they're space delimited. And F Sharp's way too far down the road, I think, to suddenly become a space delimited language. Um, so the curly you mean bracket. C sharp is. C sharp is. Yeah, what did I say? You said F sharp. <laughs> I'm sorry. F sharp space limited. C sharp's pretty far down, and, and I don't think we can make that change. Uh, so yeah, the um, I think the curlies are would are more difficult. It would be I, I can't imagine a world where we could uh, get rid of uh, effectively what's what's in the method, uh, you know, or in right. property that end, uh, and which means we need to open. So I, I think, yeah, I think mean, that would be tough to do. To be clear, we've gotten rid of a lot of curlies, uh, but it hasn't been. But curlies for a group of statements, that's where it's really hard. Because when does that group end? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, uh, so the places have been where if there's only one of a thing, like uh, mm -hmm. I mentioned the expression body members. Another example is the, um, um, the what do we call them, file scope namespaces, yeah. um, where you could put a uh, namespace, blah, 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 semicolon on top of your file. Right. And that means the same as if you had all the rest of the file inside yeah. of curly braces and neatly indented to waste four spaces on your however many you use on, on your, your left side so so whenever there's like just one mm -hmm. then again the usings also the using um declarations are another example where we can eliminate curlies for the special case but not but not in general i think that's yeah i agree yeah. with kathleen completely that that I don't know how we would be able to tell the end because we can't start counting spaces now. We never did. And we, yeah, yeah. We, yeah that would break many and things. Even for the ones that have just, just one statement, if we don't put another piece of syntax in there, it still might not be clear. And another thing that we think a lot about is that we do give you a lot of ways to do things. We do not do that in a casual manner. When we add a new way to do things, and C Sharp 12 has a new way to define literal uh, literal collections. And we're super excited about it. We think you're going to love it. But it's another new way. And every time we do that, we do think about it. So there's going to have to be more when than we're moving two characters because, you know, that's just like we really need to get something when we give you another way to do something. And I know sometimes it thinks like we don't think that way, but we actually really do. We, we do try. It's just over, you know, 20 years and slowly adding things to the language. Yes, there's a lot that's been added. And I know there are many ways to do some things. And that's unfortunate. So, yeah. So um, I don't know if anything's came in. I apologize for the questions that we didn't get answered. Um, I, I really enjoyed today. Thank you so much, Mads, for joining me. And I think I screwed up my bad once. So thank you for correcting me twice. So thank you for correcting me. Thank you for your patience with me today. And uh, I just really had fun. So Mads, uh, thanks so much for, for joining us. I'm so impressed at how you hung in there, Kathleen. Um, I, I hope you get better soon. And um, why don't we do one of these again uh, in the not too distant future? Why, we, we don't have to wait a whole year. Uh, Let's do it. Were, I, I see there are many questions and topics we could have touched on and we didn't. So, so let's yeah. do it. Let's, let's get you back on a regular basis. I really look forward to that. And next time we'll try to have a, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have a great round table next time, uh, next time you come. So uh, that'd be great. All right. So everybody have a wonderful rest of your day or evening or whatever time it is for you. Thanks everyone. <laughs>